Good morning. morning. Welcome. My name is Ellie Mirapol, and I am so happy to see all of you here. This conference is brought to you by about 20 volunteers and several dozen sponsors and granters and by Straw Dog Writers Guild. We are deeply grateful for all of the support we've gotten from our community. Thank you. The process of reimagining, resurrecting, and revising a writer's event started in 1987 has been enormously challenging and satisfying. It has been an adventure. Today is not only about panels and workshops and a wonderful keynote. It's also about creating connections between writers. It is about all of you. It's about all of us. Today is also about the Abel Mirapol Social Justice Writing Award. Abel Mirapol was my father-in-law. He was born in the Bronx in 1903, the son of Jewish immigrants who just before his birth fled the anti-Semitic pogroms in what is now Ukraine. I guess that makes him an in utero immigrant. He attended DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx where he wrote for its newspaper, its literary magazine, and wrote the school anthem. After college, Abel returned to teach English at DeWitt Clinton High School. One of his students was 14-year-old James Baldwin, whose description of the houses in his neighborhood with, quote, their winter coats of white, unquote, stayed with Abel for decades. Abel is best known for the song Strange Fruit, which he wrote after seeing a photograph of the lynching of Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith in Indiana. Billie Holiday first performed Strange Fruit in 1939 at Cafe Society in Greenwich Village, the only integrated nightclub in New York City at that time. Dubbed the right place for the wrong people, the club spoofed the heirs of the rich and famous. Abel published his poems and songs and plays as Lewis Allen, named after his two stillborn sons. Strange Fruit was the composition Abel was most proud of, but it also caused him political hassle. Within a year of Billie Holiday's first performance, Abel was called before New York State Commission to root out subversives and asked if the Communist Party commissioned him to write the song. Abel's body of work is unapologetically focused on social justice. Like the libretto for the opera, The Good Soldier Schweik, based on the anti-war novel by Czech writer Yaroslav Hasek. Like the, the, the lyrics to the song, The House I Live In, recorded by Frank Sinatra for a short feature that won an Academy Award in 1945. Abel told us later, that he attended a screening of the film, and when he realized that his anti-segregation verse had been cut, started yelling in the theater, shit, shit, they ruined my song. <laughs> he was escorted out of the theater and returned to New York just ahead of the Hollywood blacklist. Abel wrote hundreds of short poems almost doggerel, actually doggerel, uh, like my favorite, entitled Preference. Some would like bombs to go hippity-hoppity, pulverize people, and spare private property. In 1953, Abel and his wife, Anne, 
lived their politics in a more personal way, adopting my husband, Robbie, age six, and his brother, Michael, who was 10, after their birth parents, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, were executed. Abel was a literary social justice warrior for the 20th century. Our keynote speaker this morning, Shanta Lee, recipient of the Abel Maripol Social Justice Award, carries on that tradition in the 21st century. Shanta is a writer across genres, a visual artist and public intellectual. She won the 2020, she was the 2020 recipient of the Arthur Williams Award for meritorious service to the arts and a gubernatorial appointee to the Vermont Humanities Council Board of Directors. She works across genres, across civilizations. She's the author of two poetry collections, Black Metamorphoses, published in 2023, was a finalist for the Hudson Prize, shortlisted for the Cowles Poetry Book Prize, and longlisted for the Idaho Poetry Prize. Ghetto claustrophobia, dreaming of mama while trying to speak woman in woke tongues, won the 2020 Diode Press Full Length Book Prize and the 2021 Vermont Book Award. A chapbook, This Is How They Teach You to Want It, The Slaughter, is forthcoming from Harbor Editions. Shanta is a regular contributor to Ms. Magazine and Art New England. Her professional interests also include public health, arts, local government, and nonprofits. As a producer and writer for Vermont Public, she created the series Seeing the Unseen and In Between Within Vermont's Landscape. And she lectures on the life, on the life of Lucy Terry Prince, the first known African American poet in English literature and on the intersections between human identity and the monster figure. Shanta models for us not only a devoted and talented writer, but a dedicated literary citizen. Broadside Books has a few copies of Shanta's most recent collection for sale in the lobby, and I'm sure she'd be happy to sign after the keynote. I've had the pleasure of hearing Shanta read from her work, and I'm so excited to hear the thoughts she will share with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming, in presenting Shanta Lee with the Abel Mirapol Social Justice Writing Award and welcoming her to Right Angles. Everybody. <laughs> so this is sort of like an open letter. Uh, this is to that time we remembered what we forgot, an open letter to the doing that started with our imagination. I want to first thank the legacy of those who've come before and this moment of being in this room with this company. And again, I also just want to thank the legacy uh, that has been supported by the Mirapol family. Again, it is my true honor and I have deep gratitude. In preparing for today, I challenged myself with this question. If nothing else is remembered of these words, what is the essence of what I want to be embodied? And to embody, words must connect to feeling. 
They need to become that which we can imbibe. So I'm inviting you to imbibe with me. Take this as part elixir, part meditation, part Zen Cohen, part catechism, part manifesto. It is all of and none of those things. Follow me and think of this as choosing your own adventure because there are parts that you will remember while other parts will fall away. This is part wake, part fugue state. See this as a time when we are all sleeping, dreaming of this moment when we were summoned and reminded to do the alchemy. The alchemy of taking the internal, crossing the bridge from unconscious to that which becomes conscious with a few disappearing breadcrumbs on the way to the external. Doing this alchemy with our creation, with our tongues, with our pens, paintbrushes, with body, through the unsaid, even if none of these things are our brand of how we do the doing, all of us in this room are consciously and unconsciously tending to the gardens that have the hidden seeds that have yet to bloom. This is one of those seeds. Right now, I want you to breathe in what you know, and I want you to breathe out and clear space for this ride. Two questions that only can be answered one way. Are you dreaming? Are you awake? No. Book one of Black Metamorphosis. I also want to add this caveat too as a, a short stint that I did in black church growing up. Feel free to comment, make noise, laugh, <laughs> respond, because it will be how I know that you're alive in the room. <laughs> please do that. And even if there's an awkward part, funny part, please do laugh. That is on purpose. One, some things will climb inside. Some things will take residence. House guests of these kind refuse to be ignored. House guests of these kind do not like to starve. It is 2005. Lisa Simontelli invited me to her house for dinner, and she was working at the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, or what we call PCSW. I was working for Planned Parenthood of Connecticut, and I was overseeing a statewide internship that I had created, and I was the co-chair of the Young Women's Leadership Program, which was linked to PCSW. I'm leaving out several other things I was doing at the time, but these details are not the heart of the story. And while Lisa's cooking was amazing, a pasta dish dressed with olive oil and fresh vegetables from her garden, that was an accompaniment to the main dish. When I arrived, Lisa was playing music. The music was doing what it does when you arrive at someone's house. Sometimes you don't pay attention until your body responds to something, compelling your mouth to speak. What song is this? It's Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit. At that exact moment, I had yet to discover that Strange Fruit was what playwright, composer, poet, educator, Abel Maripol originally titled Bitter Fruit. An original poem penned by Maripol after seeing a newspaper article that also included a photograph of a lynching. That night, I tried to find a way to listen to it on loop in my car. One night becomes one month after, after visiting with Lisa. I've been playing Strange Fruit on loop and noticing the way my flesh stands on attention. I've never seen a photo of lynching. 19 years from now, another artist knowing what my project is with Black Metamorphosis and with his understanding of how I go beneath the surface will tell me about a book that exists filled with the universe of suffering that I can't imagine. Right now, I know my reaction to Billy's voice, how I never play this song at night in my apartment alone, how I need to take breaks before returning. I keep looking for something in this song on loop not paying attention to the seed planted and the way a complex root system is working its way through before it dares bloom. Question, 
what are the things that will climb inside and take residence? Answer, they are the house guests you invited, guests who do not like to be ignored, guests who will leave if you visit with them, if you feed them well. You will honor them on canvas that can be archival paper, honor with page, they saw, they came, they taught you how to translate from unsaid to said. Sometimes if you're lucky, they teach you how to unmake the alphabet. Two, be the body that is the tuning fork. Be the body that receives the invitations. No postal service, no techno deliveries, only the ones that say and sign, come here. Even if it is Cthulhuan in nature, or it's a dude calling from 2,000 years ago because you two might have something in common. Basically, bibliomancy meets necromancy. They have a child. In 2001, it's the same year I buy the Divine Comedy that I see a 400 plus page book on a shelf. A book with a mostly black cover, a marble statue of a woman being pursued by a man. They are in motion and my barely 21 year old eyes are curious about what kind of play is going on before learning that Daphne is running for her life from the god Apollo. Being mythically inclined, this book with two simple yet loaded words on the cover, Ovid and Metamorphosis, I need this book in my possession. Much like the other book I purchased that year, they say it on my shelf, the place of purchase is not important. However, I can tell you a few details. There was a tree, or so I imagined a tree, outside of the door that provided shading to this small building. It's cat corner to Trinity College's Performance Center. My description and what I see in my head now feels like it went missing upon seeing the campus a few years ago. And at this point, I am officially your unreliable narrator. <laughs> Well, from this place, there or not, I purchased the book that I finally read from cover to cover between the space of 2017 and 2018. I was familiar with parts of the stories presented by then. Between the space of reading and visiting the Borghese Museum in Italy, I warmed my fingers against the marble of Bernini's portrayal of Daphne begging the gods to set her free from the god who refused no. I kept circling the statue of sleeping hermaphrodite and wondering about why this wish and wondering about the taste of that kind of longing. I bumped into an Avidian society along the way, attended a conference or two sessions trying to understand the world of the man who wrote this text while asking the bigger questions about forced shape shifting versus the reward within Ovid's universe wondering if I could be any of the villains in his stories and this. Are some among us so struck with hunger like Erisichthon that we're never satisfied? My later work on a poetry foundation guide would invite me to ask the even bigger question. How does one nature, nation of origin impact their verse in conscious and unconscious ways? By the end of my full read, I was intent on writing Black Metamorphosis with such a certainty, ignoring this response to my declaration, that is bold. Come close, close enough to chase the girlhood that hovers on borrowed time of she who is woman disguised as girl fading from view, dignity held, neck popped, still stiff, despite awkward configuration and lips, refusing passage, saying, I'ma let you think you can take this, eyes adding punctuation. Tapestry instructions for care. Read between time, appear the missing. Read unwanted, bargained. Follow the loops over and under age 220 years, take me out of the archive, place me in the open, let your tongue go missing. Excerpt of Philip Mela's Tapestry Speaks for African Girl Nude Reclining on Couch, circa 1882. 
And while the work is very much rooted in the historical with a creation of an alternate universe in response to the forcibly traveled black body, my hope for the book was as simple as this. Perhaps a little Irish girl, maybe a boy in Mumbai, anyone would pick up my book and be so inclined to do the mything with bold permission. Question, what is the tuning fork? Answer, beyond ears, a tuned taut body ready for the subterranean thing that can't even be contained with the Cthulhuan body or description. It says, it signs, come here. Three, let the telling compel and command. You are nothing less than yourself. Let the telling command. You and your work are fluent and unapologetic. You and your work through the tell makes the 24 million miles long tale of Haley's Comet filled with envy, green-eyed, given the length of that kind of audacity. Somewhere in the wind of Herald Street, Hartford, Connecticut, Alan, Jamie, someone's actions prompted one of us to sound the alarm. Ooh, I'm telling. The arrangements of the series of O's with combined vowels and consonants after the short phrase all together in sum was enough to make all 24 million miles of Haley's Comet's tell green eyed. This training invited me to tell and tell, unraveling the tapestry of the edict. Children seen, not heard. While honing my superpower of, I am here, I am not, invisibility. Walking between here and not the night I sat on the side of the highway and decided it was time to get a witness, tell about what was happening within my marriage. I called my aunt and uncle telling them, please, I need you to witness this. Please don't say anything. As I called my then husband back, this time with witnesses. That highway, a reminder of when I walked the highway to get home as a 14 year old because my mother had driven away and with no bus money, I was only reminded of the way my family would drive home from downtown Hartford to Collins Street through a short highway trip. Ironic how literal margins of highway day or night can make something both visible and invisible. Between those two moments, more than 30 years apart, I became masterful in knowing when I needed to sound the alarm, how, ooh, I'm telling, was not just a childish threat to check the wrongdoer, it was a promise. I crossfit trained in telling with pen, with voice, I told in ways that my body most did not care to read. The thing about telling is that sometimes it chooses you. Like the many times that any of us have ever had a plan for something we're going to create and what surfaces is not what you're consciously planning. We love those surprises, right? Sometimes telling like art is as urgent as the bitter and strange fruit that Abel Mirapol was moved to pen. That kind of urgency compels and commands you towards the telling, towards the need to respond, towards navigating the complex equations of humanity. It chose me over and over and again in late August 2022. I had just attended the funeral of my cousin my same age who died with little information on how it happened. This weekend was filled with seeing my father's side of the family for the first time since I was nine years old, paired with the surprise of seeing my estranged parents. As I prepared to leave for that weekend, that included introducing an author at a reading and convincing a friend to crash a wedding, another story for another time, I was met with this paraphrase, I, th this statement that I now paraphrase from my then husband. It would be beneficial for you to stay. In my flurry of getting ready to face all of these moving parts, plus grief, I retorted, what is this? Are we on the set of The Godfather? 
The stern look I received alongside the way that not so veil threat stuck and struck me, signaling now it was time to sound the alarm because what of me and all I created would be destroyed if I stayed. It was time to tap into the childhood declaration turned chant, I'm telling, because my life, my art depended on telling in ways that included the uncomfortable, law, court, having strangers in my business, becoming comfortable with so many jugular veins, interrupting skin under precise cut of my telling, my life looking like I was on the set of Jordan Pills Get Out, only this time in a cabin. The transition into this kind of telling navigated between visibility and invisibility now had rules of engagement I'd embodied across the span of the margins of those highways. Now telling required one, becoming the witness to oneself to the voice inside that says, do this now, while gathering other witnesses. Several months prior, in the late spring of 2022, something said, record everything, take photos, open your damned mouth to tell your friends and family. This kind of witness gathering because, two, certain kinds of bodies require additional evidence because those bodies in and of themselves are not enough. For certain kinds of bodies, it is as Zora Neale Hurston says, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. Three, during the telling, be ready to live your full monstrous glory because you will be and do the monstering and other versions of the story. This is a superpower. Four, keep the self intact because audacity for telling will demand it. I needed to stay intact, not just to face one person, but three separate cases, a divorce, an eviction that was self-represented and working with the state's attorney regarding the police report I filed, a whole family, all of their financial resources, also challenging the lawyer who represented me for the early parts of this, in addition to several documents marching in and out of my inbox, regardless of any holiday. Five. The audacity to tell comes with tools, which means being ready for the day without the cover of night. The tell happened on the day I left that cabin in late summer day in August of 2022, a cabin belonging to my ex, not yet ex's wealthy family that was in the woods. My heart threatened to knock me over with its thumping, knowing I would not be returning the same way. In between filing the police report and the restraining order, I kept counsel with friends asking, must I do this? While well, they reflected back in Inevitable as my mirrors and words and actions saying, you have no other choice. I filed a report. I shared a detailed timeline with the state troopers because lucky me, I live beyond the jurisdiction of the local police. And these rules linked, and these rules, as we're talking about with the telling, they also link and connect to the beauty and truth of what we must do when we create. You become compelled to do the doing and whatever your medium is for telling. You need writers, you need misfits, those who knew about shadow working before it became a buzz because they had no choice. Those who do nothing less than be, bear, and do ministry of witness. Those with whom we are kenned and kin. Your league of extraordinary badasses. Given their knowledge of when, where, and how they warrior in silence and loud and action with all grace, you and the work that you create will demand nothing less because we are inevitably bearing witness to a world that within its falling apart offers us an opportunity to build a different configuration. Question. How can your telling dare to make the 24 million miles long tell of Haley's comment green-eyed answer. B 
Be, bear, and do witness while flinching. Witness while unflinching as the potency of the telling is so unapologetic that it refuses anything other than to be itself. The telling commands you to be nothing less than your audacious self on that page in your voice across all creating. Come ready, come prepared for the day without the mask and the shadow, AKA night and the way that Gwendolyn Brooks penned best. Even if you are not ready for the day, it will not always be night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Four, create as if last breath. Create with this knowing. A life will risk itself to get to your work one day. Thus, risk your life in the making of it. In 2010, Edwidge Danticat was ready when she declared in her book, Create Dangerously, the Immigrant Artist at Work, this. Create dangerously for people who read dangerously. This is what I've always thought it meant to be a writer. Writing, knowing in part that no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them. She lived this truth. Danticat faced criticism from her Haitian community for her talent and her previous work and facing these words. A parasite who exploited her culture for money and what passes for fame. Within Create Dangerously, she asks, what is the alternative for me or for anyone else who might not dare to offend? Self-censorship? Silence? Question. What relies on a dare to some, an imperative to others, and for very few, never a question? Answer, it must be done, because every single life depends on it. Five, some things should not be surrendered. They can be dressed in skin. They can be dressed in the socially acceptable cloak, the feral. Nurture where your wild things grow. For years, I was mad at myself for not pursuing the research paper on the different versions of Sleeping Beauty. So I tried to collect as many books about fairy tales as I could. That is how I met them. First, it was Maria Tartar with her edited collection of classic fairy tales with variations of some of these tales. That is how I met her. The reverberations of his purring rocked the foundations of the house. The walls began to dance. I thought it will all fall. Everything will disintegrate. He dragged himself closer and closer to me until I felt the harsh velvet of his head against my hand, then a tongue, abrasive as sandpaper. He will lick the skin off me. And each stroke of his tongue ripped off skin as after successive skin, all the skins of a life in this world and left behind a nascent patina of shining hairs. My earrings turned back to water and trickled down my shoulders. I shrugged the drops off my beautiful fur. The last words from Angela Carter's The Tiger's Bride. Angela's words and I got separated by years, but those lines and each stroke of his tongue ripped off skin after successive skin, all skins of life in the world. I remembered reading them for the first time. My stomach flipped as if I was riding a roller coaster while my brain tried to make sense of these words. This, this can't be what I think it is, I repeated to myself. Her words caused me to put the book down. Her words made me both afraid and intrigued to search out her collection, The Bloody Chamber. What struck is how those words refused to leave, adding to a growing forest within me that included breaking into abandoned places, becoming fluent and sophistiferal, becoming better in cloaking it by day, yet knighting to redeem it all and demanding more from every encounter, inviting others to join me in this thing with no name while following those breadcrumbs that refused my mouth the alphabet. 
My body dismembers and remembers memory until the tiger and his bride surface, demanding that I expose myself with these words. I remember this story. What was the name? The woman. She, she was an animal. Between the spaces of time, the first one that prepared me to understand Angela was Toni Morrison's Jazz, one character for her name simply as Wild, Wild, and then Sula, and then Beloved, and all the humanity and Toni Morrison's universe that taught me the truth of the math of doing life without apology. Between the spaces of another time, I am in India. This is where I meet them while living there for five months. Righteous rage, an allegory in the form of goddess Sati. And one version of this tells she transforms into 10 distinct manifest manifestations of herself, preventing Lord Shiva from escaping during an argument. I loved this part, actually. Those 10 Mahavidyas, Kali, Tara, Shinanasta, Sadasi, Matangi, and all the others also known as the great wisdoms. Beyond these complex stories is the space that occupies in the in-between, sending dispatches to ensure that my eyes and body stay trained to and see all that could be cloaked with skin alongside what resists such a thing. Question, what is the thing that should not be surrendered? Answer, the self whose skin is sometimes a page, sometimes voice, other times body. The pen is in service to that body that cloaks the feral. The pen is in service to the spirit that sometimes forgets. The pen follows breadcrumbs. The pen, how it reminds. Six, the Nina Simone theorem. To give is to receive. Play, baby, play. Play to that edge. Not doing so is not an option. Doing an interview for my creative thesis, the woman who would eventually become my mentor, award-winning author Emily Bernard, talked about encountering certain works that felt like the pages were safe. And in Emily's words, this kind of work costs nothing. And because it costs nothing to the maker of this work, the one receiving it gains nothing. This, as Emily said within her conversation, I'm now paraphrasing, versus a work created that is shared with a depth of personal cost, a depth of truth telling that goes through the work so that other people can live. Whether that work is on canvas, a post, in a story, a poem, we know the hollow feeling of safe work even if we cannot articulate it. In this interview with Emily, she declared, we have to be about that business of saving each other lives. There really is no other business to be about. Emily went on to tell a story about reading an article about Nina Simone sharing. Nina Simone knew that people would come to see her play. She knew she'd packed the house because people knew she was playing very close to the edge. Every night, they wanted to see if she could make it. Some were there with their popcorn and others, they were there because they needed their lives saved. They needed lessons on how to live, Emily went on to say. This is the contract between the performer or writer that you play hard. You got to play for everybody. You got to play for the cheap seats, everybody, because everybody's life is at stake. Nina Simone played to all kinds of edges, especially when it came to a record company trying to take her records without compensating her. That's a story that you're going to have to look up in your own time. <laughs> Seven, I played to the edge over and over and over again. I played to the edge as I sat in a contested place, the place I refused to leave as I fought my own eviction against my in-laws who were trying to remove me from their second home, in the shadow of a lawyer who said that she would take the case and then decided against it. I wrote a collection of stories jumping into fiction, made plans trying to recover lost time in preparation for the launch of my second book. And on February 14, 2023, the biggest invitation to play was issued. My motion 
in opposition to the plaintiff's opposition to the motion to reconsider. 16 pages over 40 paragraphs, over 5,000 words later, was due. Also this day is significant because it was the launch of Black Metamorphosis. As a fellow artist put it, I was living metamorphosis while it was coming out into the world. I had a choice. I could have chosen to meet the very firm court deadline and plan for some other kind of launch for another day. However, leaving behind something that not only I worked for, but that gave me joy was out of the question. And I'd be lying if I did not confess that during this period, I considered a lot of hard things, including quitting everything. I had to fight myself not to. The day I pressed send on that court document, I rewarded myself by launching yet another version of a book trailer to announce my second poetry book, a book illustrated by Alan Blackwell, my interpretation, interrogation, and conversation with Ovid came out on that very day. Question, what is this going to cost? Answer, what is the division, multiplication, and subtraction of keeping eyes open, a pulse going? How will you fight even yourself to do such a thing? What is the admission to play like every life depends on it? Eight, do dreams dream of themselves? Do dreams dream of us while we are awake? And Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes's Women Who Run With Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Women Archetype, Dr. Esses shares this story. One night, four Rabinim were visited by an angel who awakened them and carried them to the seventh vault of the seventh heaven. There they beheld the sacred will of Ezekiel, somewhere in the descent from paradise to earth, one rabbi, having seen such splendor, lost his mind and wandered frothing and foaming until the end of his days. The second rabbi was extremely cynical. Oh, I just dreamed Ezekiel's will. That was really nothing at all. Nothing really happened. The third rabbi carried on and on about what he'd seen. He was totally obsessed. He lectured and would not stop with how it was, how it was constructed, all that it meant. He went astray and betrayed his faith. The fourth rabbi, who was a poet, took out a paper in hand and a reed and sat near a window writing song after song, praising the evening dove, his daughter and her cradle, and all the stars in the sky. He lived his life better than before. This next share floats across a decade or more, piercing the veil between week and sleep. A woman lays down one night. She dreams herself into a mental institution. She doesn't wonder how she got there because all the staff reminds her, you checked yourself in here. As she sits and reminds her business in the office of a woman, a woman whose skin screams dandelion, whose hair is not sorry for the way it resists all who try to tame it. She reminds the woman in the dream of the waking life. The woman who looks like this woman seems to be holding a cat that looks like Alice's Cheshire cat, except here in this dream, she only needs to know one important answer to a question. What will you do when you get out of here? I'm going to set boundaries. Nine. It comes, it trains the instrument, the body, and the vernacular freedom. It comes, reminds the spirit of itself. The work, just as freedom, doesn't ask for permission. It doesn't require that we continue to ask. Instead, it demands that we and Shnaz Patel's Unsilencing the History, the Maroons. We do not really choose books. Rather, we are chosen, adopted by them. For this section, I'm pulling from my recent review of From Silence to Revived about the Maroons, a book that was banned and confiscated 180 years ago that has chosen this time in all of us. It is now available in English for the first time. The Maroons is the only known novel by political exile and black abolitionist Louis Tamillon Huat. And it brings both uncomfortable truths in the space of respite for those wrestling with inequity 
and a lack of freedom. This juxtaposition comes at a cost. In this instance, the price paid was the suppression and silencing of Huat's work. The book was confiscated after publication as a part of a seized shipment in 1846 and declared a threat to the public order by the French colonial government. Huat was forced into exile for seven years, and the novel was erased from collective memory for nearly two centuries, threatening to also erase its creator from collective human consciousness. Remember how I mentioned that work that saves lives will cost the maker? The Maroons invites this question, what will we risk to save our quality of life? What is the route towards true freedom? The Maroons also shows us the way that suppression eventually finds release. Any work can appear to take up space, but a work that faces a question outward while crossing all boundaries of time and space in ways that agitate, that is timeless, anachronistic. The setting of the Maroons is Réunion Island, east of Madagascar. Beginning in media rays, we are greeted by a ravishing landscape, and we meet four enslaved men as one of them announces, our time as slaves is up, brothers. Enough is enough. The book unzips as we meet individuals who choose different pathways to their unquestionable right as humans to freedom. It ends with some of these lines. Dismantling the absurd theory of black disposition to servitude, they keep recruiting new members every day. As masters' abuses escalate, so do their numbers. The numbers connect to the increasing population of the individual who become maroons. Who are the masters who increase their abuses in this moment? Do we have the heart tapping into the Latin root of the word courage to continue to live and claim ourselves, our freedom, and full command of self outside of the construct of who or what we call our bosses, our institutions, our systems? Do we have the audacity to take ourselves back through what we create and how we live our lives? 10, it demands discomfort. Sometimes blood, as we may possibly cut ourselves on the played to edge. It demands, it is 1975, and we are at the Cologne Opera House. It is sold out and filled to capacity with over 1,400 people coming to fill said opera house here, Keith Jarrett play. He requests a very specific piano. However, the piano he's introduced to by the young promoter is busted. The request and threat was simple. Get a working Boisendorfer imperial piano or else Keith Jarrett will not play. The current Boisendorfer was unplayable. The pedals stuck. It was trashed upper and lower octaves. Its sound was not full enough to fill the hall. It was eventually tuned. The confinement invited Jarrett to avoid the keys that would not produce the desired sound. <laughs> <laughs> the incident across several sources include different facts about the evening. The way Jarrett kept engaging with the piano by standing and really pressing on the keys, more like pounding. The physical pain and exhaustion along with the back brace to support his spine. The moment will go down as one of the highlights of Keith Jarrett's career. A moment in which some audience members stated that they knew they were in the presence of something special. 11, present day. I am somewhere doing something and listening to her message. She tells me of a dream she had because this is what we do. We talk about our dreams the way we talk about our art practice. She says she forgot how to imagine while awake. This is how we remind each other. Her note reminds me about the woman who, during sleep and wake, saw herself asking a question and seeking answers. What can I contribute to this world that is unmaking itself? This woman answers the question with all the things she can't do. She can't garden. She can't build large-scale structures. She forgets the size of her heart, her capacity for holding all the things. She forgets the lives she's saved. This woman is reminded that the world has un been unmade so many times and remade over and over and over again. 
much like the repeated heartbreak, much like the ways she knows well what it is to be unmade to unravel. The world somehow, she knows, seems to survive itself. She feels the answer creeping from the base of her spine, finding its way to other parts of her body. She knows the answer in the way that people smile when people tell her that they become free because she gave them permission. As she reminds them, you already had it. She does the doing of handing people back to themselves and they forgot in the same way that her and her friends hand dreaming back to each other. And in doing this, one of the meanings of her name, peace in Hindi, has long eluded her, reveals itself. This handing back is about peace tied to permission, tied to liberation. She finds the answer to her question. My friend's note also reminds me of what the next state of our creative evolution, self-evolution and evolution of social justice will require. The way that we get out of our own way, that we step away from the skin inheritance of all class, all identity, all everything. Remember what we keep telling ourselves about the star man who waits in the sky in our various stories, along with the dispatch that is a reminder as what we hear or as what I hear as David Bowie's lullaby that reminds, there's a star man waiting in the sky. He'd like to come to meet us but he's afraid he'll blow our minds. There's a star man waiting in the sky. He's told us not to blow it. <laughs> That's the key part, he's told us not to blow it. <laughs> As the best art especially in the realm of sci-fi or anything that we have ever told ourselves involving space in the future, whether utopic or dystopic, there's a precise and surgical cut to the root of our humanity. We are being invited to shed our infancy, much in the same way we are invited to shed said infancy when seeing Nikolai Kardashev's scale, known as the Kardashev scale, which measures civilization's technological advancement, it invites us to shed, especially when we realize that we're not even at level one as a species or a civilization on his scale. Shed our toddlerhood or limitations of how to embrace the bigger questions. What it means to embody sentience beyond the container of what we construct within a marrow, confine well, within the marrow and within the narrow confine of what we say is human. This next step requires all of us in our work to become something like Lissy and Alice Walker's Temple of My Familiar. Lissy, who across 500,000 years has existed as all things. It requires that we become the version of Doctor Who, who has to meet all the versions of himself through others and through his experiences along the way to the death, birth, and death. The next step, as instructed in Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, published in 1993, set in 2024, when social inequity and social climate change adversely impact human life. Within this story is a book referred to as the, book, as the books of the living. Intermittently, we are greeted with the words like the following. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. In closing, in the style and spirit of this whole talk of part coin, part meditation, part fugue, all of and none of those things, I'll end with the questions. You can engage with your own answers. I would also like to thank my beloved Damon Honeycutt because creative work, as I've shown throughout this talk, requires others. Our work, like the change within the books of the living, my beloved reminds me, always say yes. And though our hearts will break and get fissured in this world, we need to keep them open enough so we can be brazing enough to keep doing what we do. So thank you, Damon. And 12.
That open also means being open to these questions. It is your turn to construct your own answers through what comes out on whatever your canvas is. What are your in-between spaces? What is the shiny, sharp edge that you dare? What must you invite inside that allows you to translate the unsaid into said? What, how, when, and where will you undo the alphabet you know even at the risk of breaking your own tongue doing it? When you started this journey, what was your original state of joy that you can remember before anything like the system of everything from publishing to public response threatened to steal your original pleasure? How will you be dangerous and have the nerve to still see the beauty of yourself? How will you nurture the soil for the wild things to bloom? What is your version of the bitter fruit that's left the taste that refuses to leave and launches you into action? Thank you.